Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you, all of you, for being here. It's uh, always a pleasure to have an informal discussion with friends. What I, I would like to talk, tell you about today is liquid crystals. Now, before I begin, I did want to mention that uh, now that you're all sitting here and you have food in front of you and you're probably not going to run away, this is going to be a mathematical physics talk. Now, this means a lot of different things, but one, the most important thing that I think it means is that if any of you wants to interrupt me at any point because something is not clear, you are encouraged to do so for questions and comments at any point during the lecture. So I want to tell you about liquid crystals and I'm in lead conjecture. I'll mostly talk about liquid crystals, tell you what they are, why you should care. But before I do, I want to tell you about liquids. I want to tell you about crystals. Um, spoiler, liquid crystals are neither, but it's still useful to to uh, see that. So you may know that lots of materials, take water, for instance, come in different phases. Water, in its, in, at room temperature and atmospheric pressure, is liquid. It's what you have in your glasses here. It has properties that, uh, that we all know and love. Now, if you were to cool that water down below zero degrees Celsius, it would freeze. It would turn into ice. Ice is a crystal. On the other end of the spectrum, if you were to warm water up to over 100 degrees Celsius, it would start to boil and turn into a gas. Okay? Now, these three phases, they have very different properties. Gases tend to occupy whatever volume you give to them. If you put a, a little bit of gas in the middle of a room, it will tend to occupy the entire room. Liquids, they, are, they behave differently. They're more localized. They tend to... to bunched together. However, the defining property of a liquid is that liquids flow. They're fluid. The water in your glass will not stay in your glass if you're not careful. Crystals, on the other side, they, um, they're rather rigid. It's hard to change the shape of a solid. If I take an ice cube, I can throw it around, it won't change its shape. Now, we all know this. What I would like to focus on today is why these properties are true. Can we understand these properties from a different perspective, from a microscopic perspective? This is a non-trivial question, because from a microscopic perspective, vapor, liquid water, and ice, they're all made of the same stuff. It's the water molecule, which is just a simple molecule with two hydrogens and one oxygen. So what makes these three phases, which have such different physical properties, different? from a microscopic perspective. So this is a, a caricatural picture of what, what's going on, of the difference between gases, liquids, and crystals. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of what, uh, what is going on. On the left here, I have a picture of what a gas would be. In a gas, you have very few molecules, or rather the molecules are very far apart from each other. And by being far apart, they essentially don't see each other. They do their own thing, each in their own corner, without worrying about the positions of the other molecules. This is why a gas ends up occupying all the volume that's given to them, because you put these molecules over here, but they're all just going in their own direction, and they end up filling the entire space. Now, liquids are much more dense. There are many more molecules per unit volume in a liquid. This makes liquids much heavier, which makes them more subjected to gravity, which is why the water in your glass stays in your glass if you don't touch it. However, uh, okay, so liquids are dense. Crystals are also dense. There are lots of molecules. They're all packed in close together. But the defining difference between a liquid and a crystal is that in a crystal, there is order. Crystals, in a crystal, the molecules tend to arrange themselves in regular patterns, just like the one that is depicted here. Whereas in the liquid, there is no order. There is disorder in that the molecules just form this amorphous clump. Now, okay. the, this difference that explains uh, the, the difference in the properties, in the macroscopic properties of liquids and crystals. This rigid structure, this um, regular structure in crystals is what gives them their rigidity. Because if you have a if you have a regular structure, it's hard to modify it without breaking the whole, the whole system. And this can actually manifest itself uh, in natural phenomena in a rather striking way. 
or this is just the picture I had earlier. This is an actual picture of a mineral, this, uh, this cube here. It's a mineral called pyrite. It's, it's essentially iron and other impurities. That cube there hasn't been cut. This cubic shape was not created by a human. This is how pyrite grows in nature. When you find pyrite on the ground, it looks like that. This striking cubic shape comes from the cubic arrangement of the atoms that make up pyrite. This is really no small feat, because in, the, in, a, in a sample like this one, there are lots of atoms, a lot of atoms. There are 10 to the 24 atoms. That's a one with 24 zeros after it. It's called a heptillion. A he there's a heptillion atoms in there. Heptillion is a trillion trillions. So just to give you an idea of the scale of this, if you were to count all the grains of sand that we have on Earth, you would get to a number that's not even close to the number of atoms that's in there. That's a lot of atoms. And for some miraculous reason, they happen to all be arranged in this regular cubic structure. That's rather astounding. Crystals? No, the cubes. Oh, uh, those. So oh, there's, a, there's a growth process when you have these, these atoms. They arrange themselves. And when some, something comes in and perturbs the growth process, then it usually stops or it breaks or you start forming a new crystal. So you have, uh, so like you can see here, uh, you have a crystal here and then this other one started growing within the other crystal. So this is when some, something external comes and perturbs it. Further questions? OK. OK, so crystals have this regular structure, and it can have these, these uh, striking uh, ma macroscopic manifestations. Now, liquids, on the other hand, the fact that they're disordered, that they're a clump of molecules, is what allows them to flow, because there's nothing stopping them from flowing. The molecules can just roll around each other, so which is why why liquids typically flow. So, in short, a liquid is disordered, and, an, and a crystal is ordered. There is a regular periodic structure in a crystal, and there is none in a liquid. So this beckons the question, well, what in the world is a liquid crystal? Well, a liquid crystal is a material, is a, is a phase of matter, just like liquids, crystals, and gases. It's a phase of matter that shares some properties of ordered matter, and some properties of disordered matter. So how does that come about? Well, typically, liquid crystals occur in systems of molecules that are very anisotropic. So let's take, let's restrict our attention to one family of, of materials, which are called pneumatic liquid crystals, which occur in systems of rod-shaped molecules. So all matter is made of atoms or, or molecules, and these are, sh are very long and thin. I'm going to give you two examples of, of such, such systems. This here on the left is the standard liquid crystal that is, is constructed in labs and used for experiments. It's called MBBA. Uh, the black atoms here are carbon. The, the white ones are hydrogen. This is, a, this is an oxygen. This is a nitrogen. It's a molecule. And you see that it's long, and it's not very thick. It's longer than it is thick. Now, the second one is a... An example I like, this comes from biology. This is a picture of a virus called the tobacco mosaic virus. You don't need to be worried. It mostly affects tobacco plants. It's, it, and each virus is shaped like a cylinder. It's essentially about 300 nanometers long, about 18 nanometers wide. It's a, a thin, long, rigid cylinder. And this occurs in nature. Now, in these sorts of materials, where the molecules are very elongated and, wrong sh and, and rod shaped, you can have order and disorder. So this would be a caricatural representation of a pneumatic liquid crystal phase. Here I'm representing the molecules as these oblong uh, ellipsoids. The order in here is in the orientation. The orientation of these molecules is essentially the same for every molecule. If I have a macroscopic liquid crystal, a large sample, a large liquid crystal, essentially all the molecules will be po pointing in essentially the same direction. That's order. That's, that's the analog of having a regular periodic structure in a crystal. 
That's the crystal part of the liquid crystals. On the other hand, if I look at the positions of the molecules, if I would just look at, the, at where the molecules are located, it kind of looks like a clump. There is no order in the positions of the molecules. Okay? So I have order in the orientation and disorder in the position. There's order and disorder. There's crystalline properties and liquid properties. This is what makes them liquid crystals. I want to show you a, a liquid crystal. This is a video I got off YouTube. This is a, a pneumatic liquid crystal being grown in the lab. I'm going to stand here. So these little droplets are the liquid crystal. And you see they're slowly expanding. And as they expand, you'll see they start to merge together. Now if you see this, it looks like a liquid is forming, right? These little drops are flowing into each other. Liquid crystals, they flow, they, they are fluid because there's disorder in the position of these liquid crystals. And that allows them to merge and have this overall liquid shape. Now the order manifests itself in a different way. You'll notice that all of these drops have this eerie iridescence. That comes from the order in the orientation. The order in the, in the orientation gives these materials non-trivial optical properties. The way they react with light is non-trivial, it's, it's peculiar. Now, this is a video. I wanted to show you a real liquid crystal. Oops. This is not. OK. This is a liquid crystal here. This is a coaster I keep in my office. Uh, it's brown. That's a little brown square. I bought this off Amazon. Now, in this, uh, in this material here, there's a, a thin layer of liquid crystal. This is what's called a thermotropic liquid crystal, which means that the, the orientation of the molecules inside this coaster depends on the, on the ambient temperature. So if I heat up the coaster by putting my hand on it, oops, now it's all, it's dark blue. <coughs> I'll show it to you later when it cools down. So this is a, OK, here it's turning slightly green. So the color is changing as the temperature is being varied. This makes for a great coaster if you're drinking hot drinks. So these liquid crystals, they have these non-trivial optical properties. The way they interact with light is non-trivial. And this is what makes them so interesting and so important because it turns out that liquid crystals have been used in display technology for over 50 years. Most of the displays that you've interacted with today are probably based on liquid crystals. They're used for digital wristwatches. Uh, they're used for pocket calculators, uh, Game Boys. I don't know if any one of you has ever used a Game Boy. Uh, I certainly have. Uh, more recently, flat screen computer monitors, flat screen TVs, cell phones, all these displays are based on liquid crystals. In fact, if you've gone off to buy a TV in the past 15 years, you may know the term LCD. LCD stands for liquid crystal display. Anything that's an LCD is actually based on the use of these liquid crystals. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more on how, how this works. I won't go into much detail. Essentially, the property that makes liquid crystals useful for display technology is that it's not too difficult to design an electronic light filter based on, on liquid crystals. What is an electronic light filter? It's a, think of a small device that is transparent if I leave it at rest, and it becomes opaque if I run a small current through it. So at rest, it's just a regular transparent piece of plastic. But if I run a current through it, it won't let light go through. The way that these are designed, which out, without going into too much detail, is you take two polarizing filters. These are, are, are objects that have been known for a long time. And you put a liquid crystal in the middle. When you run an electrical current, you switch between two different types of liquid crystals. And you can turn this filter on or off. You can turn this transparent surface into an opaque surface. So how does that help me design? displays, well, you may know that the way that pictures are rendered on display these days, the way that pictures are rendered in a digital fashion, is 
through a collection of pixels. The image that's being displayed on the screen right now is actually a collection of a few tens of millions of pixels. Each pixel is a little square, rather a little rectangle, that is of one color, of one fixed color. And by putting these pixels together, you can form an, a rather complicated image with, with lots of different colors. Now, this here is a magnified picture of pixels on a, on, a, on a display. Three of these, so the colors are not being rendered too well. This is blue, this is green, this is red. If you take a, tripl a triplet of these, you get one pixel. Each pixel all consists of one blue light, one green light, and one red light. I thought I would just comment briefly on why those colors. This is, takes me to elementary color theory, which is one of my favorite subjects. Turns out the human eye can, dis can see three different colors. The human eye perceives color through three different receptors. One receptor is susceptible to blue, one receptor is susceptible to green, and the third is susceptible to red. This means that you can reproduce essentially all the, response, all, all the color responses of the eye by using just three different colors. By using a red light, a green light, and a blue light, you can essentially reproduce most of the colors that the human eye can see. This is why pixels are made up of a green, a blue, and a red light. That's how they reproduce most of the colors. The basic idea of how this works, so this is, is what's called a color wheel. It shows how to combine colors to get different colors. I have blue down here, green, and red. And by combining blue and red, I get these pinks and purples. I get yellows by putting in green and green into the red, and I can get these cyan colors by uh, combining blues and greens. So let's get back to, to pixels. So how do I design a display? I have, in each pixel, a little blue light, a little green light, a little red light. In front of each of these, I put an electronic light filter. I turn the light filter on or off, or I, I can have various gradations of, of uh, of on or off, of you know, half on, half off, in order to reproduce whatever color I want that pixel to be. So I take the image that I want to represent, I cut it up into pixels, I decide which color each of the pixels should be. By turning the light filters on and off, I can reproduce that color on a display. Now, uh, before I move on to the math part, um, what I told you today is about LCDs. If you have actually gone to by a television in the past few years, you might have heard of this new technology called OLEDs, O-L-E-Ds. That's a new technology that will maybe replace LCD technology. The idea there is that instead of putting light filters in front of each of these, of these light sources, you control the intensity of the light source directly. Now, this is not a, such an easy, easy thing to do, and they had to develop a lot of technology. That's what the OLEDs are, organic light-emitting diodes. They're little lights that can be easily tuned to be, to be set on or off um, sufficiently fast to, to work in a display. Now, as of yet, these displays are rather expensive, so LCDs are still the norm. But it's likely that in the, in the nearish future, we'll all end up having OLED screens in our hands. Anyways, despite that, I hope I've convinced you that liquid crystals are there. They're important, and we need to understand how they work. You can use them all every day. It's good to understand how these things work. Now, one of the projects that I've been involved, involved in the, the past few years was to take a first step in that direction in understanding how they work. And the very first step is to understand how they exist. Why in the world are these liquid crystal phases there? What can explain their behavior? Phrased another way, I want to find a model, something that I can understand from a mathematical perspective that will represent these elongated molecules. And within this model, I want to find a proof. I want to find a theorem that says that I indeed have orientational order and positional disorder, that I have a liquid crystal phase where all my molecules tend to align, but their positions are not aligned, that I have a material that flows and has these weird optical properties. This, it turns out, is a rather 
old subject. Uh, well, the liquid crystals have been, they, they were discovered by accident at the end of the 19th century. Um, in 1944, there was a seminal paper by a, a Norwegian-American chemist named Lars Onsager, who started studying this, uh, these materials and found a, a theory for why they are the way they are. The main issue with Onsager's work is that from a mathematical perspective, it's not entirely complete. Some of the mathematical details in, in Unsager's theory are not fully worked out. And in fact, to this day, they have not been. We do, do not know how to make rigorous mathematical sense of Unsager theory. Now, the reason for this is that the model that Unsager was considering is too complicated. It contains ingredients that we don't know how to control. So a natural first step is to look at a simple model something easier than what Onsager was looking at. So this takes me to, this takes me closer to the Heinemann lead model, which is a simplified model of a liquid crystal for which we can prove the existence of a liquid crystalline phase. And I want to tell you just a little bit about what this model is. The first ingredient you need to know is that it's a planar model. It's a two-dimensional model. In this system here, my molecules, they live on a surface. They don't live in three-dimensional space. They live on a flat surface. Okay, so we're studying a two-dimensional liquid crystal. Now, the molecules in this model, they're little sticks. They're these little, little dumbbells that I drew here. Those are the molecules in my model. You see, they're allowed to occupy certain positions. These dumbbells, they all lie in the grooves of this square grid. So I have this square grid here. And I can put um, my little dumbbells in the grooves in such a way that the endpoints of the dumbbells end up in corners of this square grid. Okay? So this is a simplified model. The molecules each have positions. The position is which one of the grooves they are in. And they also have orientations. They can be vertical or they can be horizontal. So it becomes a well-defined question to wonder whether I have a liquid crystal phase. I want to know whether my molecules all tend up to all tend to align, which means that all my molecules are horizontal or they're all vertical. I can ask that question. I can ask whether the positions have any order in them. I can ask whether uh, there's a regular pattern in the way that these molecules are arranged. Well, it turns out that uh, the answer is no, there isn't. There is no liquid crystal phase in this model. We need to complicate it just a little bit in order to make that appear. We need to magnetize our molecules. We need to make them interact with each other. How do we do this? Well, imagine that these little sticks, instead of just being little sticks, they're little magnets. Now, you know that if you take two magnets and one is not aligned with the other, they're going to tend to align. That's what I want to model here. So I introduce a little force between molecules that are parallel and next to each other, that are aligned and that are next to each other. So all these little forces I drew in red in this picture here. This model here, so this model of little dumbbells on this, on this square grid with this magnetic force, that's what's called the Hyman lead model. It was introduced by, this is a, a Danish chemist by the name of Ole Heilman and Elliot Lieb. Elliot Lieb is a mathematical physicist from Princeton University. And they introduced this model in 1979. And in this paper in which they introduced the model, they proved that there is orientational order, which means that if I'm given a sample of these molecules, they'll mostly all be vertical or they will mostly all be horizontal. This is a very good sign. If I want to have a liquid crystal phase, I need orientational order. However, they did not prove that there is positional disorder, that there is no regular structure in the positions of these molecules. In order to have a liquid crystal phase, I need to have orientational order and positional disorder. So in other words, they proved that, that in this system I have some crystalline behavior, but they didn't prove that it's a liquid crystal, that it's not a crystal. This was formulated in the 1979 paper as a conjecture, that it should be true that this, uh, this system displays a liquid crystal phase. 
So this is, um, okay, so this was the, the state of affairs uh, a couple years ago. So I got here in 2016, the fall of 2016. Yes? So why don't we call it crystal? Well, because it's not. So we don't know whether, in order to be a crystal, it would have to have order in the positions. It would have to have a regular structure. Uh, so it couldn't have that grid structure for some whole line. Uh, it could, it could be a crystal, but it isn't. But it could, yeah. No, so the, the open question here is, is it a crystal or is it a liquid crystal? Yeah. Good. So I got involved in this, uh, in this project when I got here in 2016. Elliot Lieb is at Princeton University, and uh, I started working with him. We were discussing what sorts of problems we'd, we'd like to work on, and this thing popped up. And we thought it would be something that might be doable and, and would definitely be interesting. And so we worked on it. We worked rather hard for about a year. And last fall, we uh, released a, a proof of this fact. So now we know that in this Heilman Lieb model, we have a liquid crystal phase. We have orientational order. This we already knew from the 1979 paper. But we also have positional disorder. Now this is. It's, it's an OK result. We're somewhat happy. Because this is giving us some insight, so as to, uh, some insight on the problem of why liquid crystals exist. We now have a model. Well, OK, to be fair, there were other models in which this, this has also been done. But this, this gives us another model in which you can prove the existence of a liquid crystal phase. Now, that's important because this is a very simple model. There isn't that much going on. All I have are these little dumbbells that are attracting each other through these, through these interactions. There are very few mechanisms at play in this model. The fact that a liquid crystal phase emerges in here is telling us that perhaps these mechanisms are what allow real liquid crystals to exist. Now, the major limitation of this model is that my molecules can only really be horizontal or vertical. In the real world, molecules can take any position, any orientation. Um, that's a hard problem. Proving a liquid crystalline phase in a system that can take any orientation is a major open problem in mathematical physics. Uh, until we get to that point, we cannot claim that we truly understand how liquid crystals go. But this provides us with a, a nice first step. Now, before I close, I'd wanted to just mention at least one thing. Uh, if you're interested in this, uh, I, I wrote a, uh, an article in the Institute newsletter, in the fall issue of the Institute newsletter. In fact, there's some copies here if you're interested, uh, where I explain essentially what I explained today with a little more detail. So if uh, I explain a little, a little in a little more detail how these electronic light filters work. And so if you're interested, you're invited to check that out. Now, if you have any questions. Yes. Uh, just to say, uh, you, you said earlier we could build it so that you have to have a flat surface. What's flat? How flat is it? So in this situation, so I, we need to have a flat surface in order for this model to make sense. For real liquid crystals, real liquid crystals exist in three-dimensional space, in thick space. You can have a thick th a liquid crystal. In this model, this model is an idealization. And it's infinitely flat. It's flatter than anything. So it's 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 really a surface. You can but think of this. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so you can think of this. They they can actually design this sort of model in a lab. The way that you do this is you take a you take some sort of a material that will create the grid structure and you put in these little sticks. As long as you only have one layer of sticks then you'll have something that is flat. So that's what flat would mean in this case. Yes? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So uh, in all of these materials, all liquid crystals, so if, if I were to heat up my liquid crystal sufficiently, then it would change phases. It would no longer be a liquid crystal. It would turn into first a regular liquid, then eventually a gas. And if I were to cool it down, it would turn into a regular crystal. But, but the question is, in a liquid crystal, is there a difference between a good liquid crystal and a not good liquid crystal? 
Right, so the question is, since uh, heat affects the way that, uh, that molecules jiggle around, if I change the temperature within a liquid crystal, does that change the properties of the liquid crystal? And the answer to that is yes and no. It can change small things. So this is what, what is going on in here. If I change the temperature of this thing, the color will change. Uh, right, so if I, had, if I had two liquid crystals that were made of the same stuff and I put them together and they were in a different phase, they would have to be in a di of a different temperature. But I can have two different liquid crystals that have different properties at the same temperature. Or I could have a liquid that's surrounding a liquid crystal and they're both of the same temperature. If I take the liquid crystal there and dip it in water, my water is liquid and my liquid crystal will be at the same temperature. So the effect that temperature has on molecules depends on the molecules, depends on how big they are, depends on the chemical properties of that molecule. So by just specifying the temperature, it's not enough to, to give you all the properties of every molecule. It will give you the properties of one type of material. So I can definitely have two, diff two different materials, one that's a liquid crystal, the one that is not, that are at the same temperature, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the next natural step is three dimensions. Three dimensions, it turns out, is slightly nasty, and we don't quite know why yet. But the question would be, I want to take a model that's kind of similar to this, but in 3D. How do I do this? I'm going to stay on a grid. I like grids. This time it's going to be a cubic grid. So imagine I take little cubic boxes and I stack them up together. That, that gives me a cubic grid. My molecules in there are going to be long sticks that can either be vertical or horizontal in this direction or horizontal in that direction. That's, that's the model that I want to look at. Exactly, I have my three axes. Now there, we still believe that we should have a liquid crystal there. There is so far no proof of that. That would be the natural next step. We do have a result in three dimensions about a system that is similar to that, but instead of having rods, we have plates. These plates, they're parallelopipedes. They're very long. They're rather wide and then very thin. So long, wide, and thin. And we can prove that for this, this model, we also have a liquid crystal phase, which is, I think is the, the first result in three dimensions. Uh, but the natural next step is rods in three dimensions. Now, there's a, a very real reason why this is the next step, why this is the important next step, because I mentioned that really what we're after is any orientation, any possible orientation. In two dimensions, I can also have a model with any possible orientation, where my molecules can take any angle on, on the circle. There's a theorem called the Merman-Wagner theorem doesn't really apply to the situation, but if you were to modify it, it would probably apply. That says that in a model with continuous orientation, so if I can choose the orientation of my molecule in any way I wanted in two dimensions, I will not have a liquid crystal phase. The Merman-Wagner theorem is telling me that liquid crystals don't exist in two dimensions. This is why I need to understand three dimensions. The only way I can have continuous orientation is by looking at a three-dimensional model. The first step to doing that is discrete orientations in a three-dimensional model, which is still an open problem. Yes? So this may not look like it, but this is a three-dimensional liquid crystal. Turns out the arrangement of the molecules is really important in this. Oh, it's working very well now, right now. Um, the arrangement of the molecules here, the importance of the arrangement of the molecules is in this direction. It's very thin, but it does have three-dimensional structure. In the, in the light filters that are used in, in displays, the liquid crystal looks like this. So these, these liquid crystals, they have these planes here that are, are rotating in this helix, and here they're, they're pneumatic. This has three-dimensional structure, and the reason that the filters work 
is because of the three-dimensional space. Yes? So if it's three-dimensional crystals, wouldn't they all be coplanar, just happen to be in 3D? How can you prove that it's not just simply layers of a 2D and it's actually 3D? That is actually another liquid crystal phase. That's, so there, there are several different liquid crystal phase that, phases that look like that. One of them is called a spectic phase. In a smectic phase, you have a, success, a succession of planes, and in each plane, you have rods that are perpendicular to the plane, and there is no order in the positions within each plane, but each plane is stacked one on top of the other. That is a fa so one of the difficulties, actually, of dealing with three-dimensional liquid crystals is that there are many more phases in three dimensions than in two dimensions. There's this smectic phase. There's a chiral pneumatic phase, which is this one here, the phase that is here, where here I have a succession of planes, where in each plane I have rods that are all essentially aligned within the plane. They're disordered within the plane. And then from one plane to the next, the orientation of the rods rotates. And that's uh, the, the liquid crystal that's in here. That's a chiral pneumatic phase. And in fact, the amount of the, of the angle by which they're rotating determines the color. That's why the colors change. Uh, that's an iPhone? I think so. So um, I told you about OLEDs. When they're used for smartphones, they're called AMOLEDs. That stands for Active Matrix Organic uh, Light Emitting Diodes. AMOLED displays are coming into, s coming into smartphones. Off the top of my head, I don't know which brands have adopted them yet. Uh, I can tell you that mine, which is a little older, is definitely a liquid crystal. Very good question. Um, so if you have a pixel, you have a little light source, and you put a filter in front of it, and you turn the light source on and off by, um, by putting a filter in front of it. The filter is not going to work perfectly. There's going to be, first of all, there's going to be light that's going to go through the filter even though it's off, but there's also going to be light that will go around the filter. In AMOLED displays, or in OLED displays, the light is off. When, when it's supposed to be off, which means that the darks that you have in these screens are better, the blacks are better. So the contrast that you get between a dark scene and a light scene is just better. Uh, that's a good question, I don't know. Yes, I suppose. And viewing angle, and viewing angle. yes, that's a very good point. Um, the way that liquid crystals re react with light is uh, is highly dependent on the angle at which you're looking. If you have these, the the iridescent shapes that you were seeing in the in the video earlier, if you were to look at them from a different angle, they would look different. Uh, so these uh, there's a lot of work has gone into trying to make these filters rather isotropic, so you can see them, so you can see the same image from a wide variety of angles. Uh, it still doesn't work if you're if you're too far off the off the, the axis of the display, which is a problem you don't have with OLEDs. Knowledge. No, then we, so, okay. The way we think liquid crystals work, and this comes from Onsager theory, the way that we think that they exist is that you have these long molecules. These long molecules, they all have electrons. These electrons don't, electrons typically don't like each other. These molecules don't like to see each other too close. So they repel each other. The basic mechanism that we think explains the existence of these liquid crystals is that these molecules, they repel each other, so they don't want to be like this, they want to be like that. If you have enough molecules around, so if you just had two, then you know they might repel like that. But if you, if you have enough molecules around, it would end up aligning. The, the question here, the mathematical question here is, is this correct? Is this the real picture? Is this the mechanism that is, is allowing liquid crystals to exist? If we can have a model where the only way that our, our molecules are interacting is through this sort of a repulsion, even think of a very simple repulsion where my molecules are, are cylinders and they, they're not allowed to overlap. That's could be the only repulsion between them. 
if in there we can prove a liquid crystal phase, then we understand, well, then it makes this mechanism all the more um, plausible as the mechanism that makes liquid crystals work. So it's really step one of understanding, step zero, if you like, of understanding liquid crystals is really to look at what mechanisms could make these phases exist. Why are they there? So it's more of a fundamental science question, admittedly. But, uh, yes? Yes? That would, is what I suppose. I don't actually know the answer to that question, but I suppose that the, that the composition of the molecules must be related to organic uh, chemistry. So organic chemistry is, is uh, uh, anything that involves carbons, hydrogens, nitrogens, oxygens. Um, I'm guessing that's where the word organic comes from. I don't actually know for sure. Thank you all. <laughs>